Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this introductory webinar on podcasting for public library staff. My name is Michael Adams. I'm a librarian here in the Public Library Services team at the State Library. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm presenting this on Gadigal land, and I invite you to reflect on wherever it is you happen to be joining us from today. So once again, thank you for joining me. This particular subject is a passion of mine. So I'm very glad to have you all here with me and I really hope you get something out of it to get you started on your podcast journey, which I'm very confident that you will find lots of fun and really rewarding. Today, we're gonna to be providing an overview of some of the technical and creative aspects to keep in mind if you're thinking of launching a podcast at your library, this is a really big topic and I'm only going to give an overview and I'm going to leave as much time as possible for questions at the end. So you can see the, the chat feature in Zoom. Please start submitting your questions as I go along. And as I said, I'll, I'll get through as many as possible at the end. So I, I think by now podcasts are fairly well entrenched in our culture. I'm not going to be spending any time at the start going into what podcasts are, but I think it's worth setting this up by briefly giving my case for podcasts and why your library should give serious thought to getting involved. I think that podcasting might be the most democratic of all forms of media with one of the lowest barriers to entry. And to set this up, I'm going to recall a conversation about podcasts I had with my colleague Ellen here at the library a few weeks ago. And I, I can't even remember the exact context of the conversation. But at one point, Ellen said something like, and I'm sure there are podcasts about tractors. So I thought I would test that theory. And sure enough, within minutes, I was able to find multiple podcasts about tractors. So when it comes to podcasting, there is no niche too small. And what I mean about podcasts being the most democratic form of media with a very low barrier to entry, I mean that there is literally no gatekeeping. So there's nobody at Apple Podcasts who says yes or no to your podcast being available there. If you have a phone or a computer, you have a recording device, which is literally all you need to record a podcast. If we look at our tractors and look at Daniel down here, Daniel in a tractor, his podcast is literally him sitting on a tractor, talking into his phone about whatever conversation topic comes into his mind. But that goes at least some way to highlighting one of the challenges of releasing a podcast today, which is just the sheer amount of competition you'll face to get into people's earbuds. A recent report I found on a website called Podcast Insights found over 2 million podcasts in circulation. And this is a figure that had more than doubled in just three years. So to go back to tractors, you can see from this graphic, there is even competition to be the definitive podcast named Tractor Time, let alone the definitive podcast about tractors. So there are a number of things you can do to a number of tips and strategies to give your podcast the best chance of achieving your definition of success. And that is what I'm here for today, provided your definition of success isn't being the new serial or the Joe Rogan show. If, if I knew how to do that, I probably wouldn't be here. And I'm sure some of you joining me today have already had some experience podcasting and others probably have a great idea. They're just itching to produce. But for those of you who are interested in the format, but who aren't really sold on whether it's something you want to get involved in personally, or whether it's something that's right for your library, I thought I'd begin by showcasing some of the great work already being done by public libraries. So I did a call out for podcast links on the PLN a few weeks ago as well as doing some of my own research. I hope I have everyone covered, but my sincere apologies if your library is podcasting and I've missed you somehow. If that's the case, uh, put a link in the chat. Um, I, I certainly wanna hear about it and uh, I'm sure everyone joining will as well. 
So I'm just going to do a very brief run through of some of the podcasts I found uh, to hopefully inspire you and think of some of the things you can do if you want to get involved in podcasting. So I'll, I'll start with Newcastle. Newcastle is doing some amazing work on a very broad range of topics. They've got author interviews, historical series, showcasing items from their collection, uh, releasing some important social commentary as well. Parramatta have two podcast channels and like Newcastle, they're very broad in scope. I wanted to focus on their cold pods, which provide both cultural content and important community information in a range of different languages. Amy at Riverina Regional Library hosts the What's Next podcast, which is book focused and covers a range of different genres. Randwick's Local Legends podcast features interviews with a range of prominent locals like Bob Carr, Gariella, Little Patty, uh, who are all talking about their experiences growing up and or living in the area. Uh, Shell Harbour's Chat Ya Up podcast, also book-based with a specifically YA focus and a great name to boot. And this reminds me also that Kayama also have a podcast on the way, which I don't think is yet available, uh, but be sure to look out for that soon. And if anyone is here from Kayama, please let me know when, when you do get that available. Finally, Stanton has released some of its author talks as podcasts. So that's a great way of getting into the podcast space, which with content that you're already producing at your library, and it can also give your library events a broader reach. So there's something to consider there. And finally, I'd suggest having a look at some of the work being done at the State Library. Uh, some, some of my colleagues here have done some amazing work. Uh, this might give you some ideas on how you can incorporate your oral histories or other collection items into podcast form. But in this next session section, I'm just going to go through some of the creative aspects to keep in mind when you're developing your podcast. This isn't something you can be too instructive about, that there are so many different podcasts, all having different elements and requirements. So giving instruction about what works for one style would be completely wrong in another context. And an added disclaimer, one thing I would never presume to do is to tell you the sort of podcast you should make. I'm well aware of the creativity and ingenuity that public libraries are lucky to have among their staff. One of my roles in the team here is to edit the In the Libraries newsletter, and I'm constantly blown away by some of the programs and innovations I'm seeing. So I'm definitely not prescriptive in this section of the webinar. And in fact, I'm really looking forward to what we see out of public libraries in the podcasting space over the next couple of years. Rather, what I'm gonna do in this section is to just provide some general tips on converting your idea into reality. This maybe goes without saying, but having a clear idea of who this podcast is for from the outset will greatly assist with your planning. And it's also going to make the task of marketing and promoting your podcast a lot easier. And again, you know far more about your communities than I do. So that's something for you to work out. But I think it's really important to keep in mind. There is a flip side of this, however, and that's pandering. So trying to create something that you think they'll like, but you don't have any particular knowledge or passion about. And I really think it's important to avoid this. One online tip I found was a simple three word mantra, podcast your passion. I think it's really important that you are podcasting something that you personally are passionate about. This will, oops, um, this will ensure that you have enough words to say about the subject. And it will also raise the energy and enthusiasm within the recording room. And that is one of those intangibles that will make a real difference when listening to the podcast. This can be a balancing act if you work for City of Sydney, but you're desperate to add it to the growing collection of tractor podcasts that I showed earlier. I'd suggest maybe that would work best as a side project outside of work. But with any luck, you'll be able to find a way to match up your interests with those of your library users. There's also another aspect of knowing your audience that I think it's really important to consider. And that's less about your specific library users and more about podcast listeners in general. I think it's really important to understand the medium you're working with. So I'm gonna show you these three images. 
I want you to think about how you listen to podcasts. I don't know about you, but it's very rare that I'd be sitting down listening to a podcast without doing something else at the same time. I might be driving or catching the train to work, exercising. But I think for many people, listening to podcasts very often complements something else we're doing. And thinking about that, that should at least be a factor in your delivery and your style. So think about the fact that it's an audio medium and how best to engage your listeners over that medium. Is your podcast educational or informative? You may like to consider it as informal learning, something to inspire people to learn more about and to come back to after they listen to your podcast. People aren't likely to be sitting there taking notes as you talk. So this should factor into how you present your information. Think of the medium and the most effective ways of relaying information and engaging your listeners over that medium. Is that reading out a 34 letter URL address? Or is it saying, go to our show page for the link and then discussing the contents of whatever website you're talking about? And it should also go without saying that your listeners aren't in the room with you. Visual cues won't work without description. It, it really should go without saying, but it doesn't. The amount of times I've listened to podcast hosts, even professional podcast hosts, discussing an item in the room or something they're seeing on a screen and not describing it, not letting their listeners in to the conversation. It, it really should be obvious not to do that. Along the same lines, hosts laughing uproariously within a recording studio. That has a very different energy when it's somebody listening alone halfway around the world. The conversation you're having with your co-host or your guest that ultimately isn't for the two of you, it is for your listeners. So be mindful of that listening experience when you're recording. Very important considering, a very important uh, consideration, which I've somehow left out of my slideshow, is to give your podcast time. So it's very rare that a podcast gets it right the first time. Even the most professionally produced podcasts in the world can take time to find their feet. And it's actually quite fun to discover a podcast that has been around a while, going back and listening to those early episodes. Almost invariably, you'll find big differences in style, in tone, in structure. So give yourself time to find your voice and give your podcast time to discover what it is. If you have multiple hosts, it may take time to work out the chemistry and the dynamics of the conversation between you. You may end up finding the finished product quite different to what you'd sketched out on paper, and that's okay. It's not like a book where you write it, publish it, and then it's done, it's out there. If it's planned to be an ongoing podcast, it will naturally evolve over time. And that, that's one of the really special things about podcasts. Uh, along the same lines, one tip I would offer is to record a few episodes in advance of going live. And uh, apologies, I somehow left all this out of my slideshow. So you're just going to have to uh, treat it as a podcast and focus on my voice only. In the case of a limited run series, a historical narrative, or another type of nonfiction podcast that you may be interested in producing, you may even choose to script out and produce the whole series before releasing it. But even if not, giving yourself a bank of a few episodes will ease that pressure when you do go live, as well as allowing yourself the time to work out your voice in advance. You may produce two or three episodes before working out that missing element, which will give you the time to adapt and rebrand if necessary. I do think it is important to look at the market you are entering and work out where you may carve out some space within that. And this shouldn't be done in a discouraging way. I'm certainly not saying there are 40 other readers advisory podcasts, so don't do one. But it might pay to see what niche you can create within that genre, see what isn't being covered. If you listen to a few, you might also get some ideas about what you do differently or what you'd like to see in a particular type of podcast. 
And similarly, don't be afraid to blend genres and adapt them to your purposes. True crime, for instance, is a genre that's incredibly popular, dominates the podcast charts both here and overseas. And I'm sure there have been studies and papers written about true crime and this morbid attraction to crime and violence. But what you're essentially getting in true crime is an examination of an event done with varying levels of journalistic rigor. So why should that be specific to crime? What about a deep dive into the Riverina secession movement of the 1860s, a series of the bohemian art scene in Castle Crag in the 1930s. And if anyone is here from Riverina or Willoughby, those are your ideas to steal. But the main point is to think about what else exists and how might you adapt that to suit your passions and your audience. So now you have your idea, what's next? You need a means of getting it from your brain to your listeners' ears. And I mentioned earlier that if you have a phone, you have a recording device, but that doesn't mean I would recommend you using your phone to record your podcast. With the amount of other podcasts out there competing for the time of your prospective listeners, it's important to make sure that the sound of your podcast reaches a certain standard. And as I hope to show, you can achieve that sound relatively cheaply. So basically, at this point in time, there's really no excuse for bad sound. But across the 2 million or so podcasts out there, there is a whole variety of production styles that will deliver different sound outcomes for different budgets. If we look at a hierarchy, I've grouped these into four general categories, which it, it's it's, uh, it's, it's imperfect. Any experts in the subject will be gnashing their teeth and saying I've got it wrong. I've just done my best to kind of group these in, in a way that makes sense to me and, and hopefully makes it easy for you to understand it. So at the lower end, you have devices like phones. You've got the recording facilities of your computer using the inbuilt mics included in these devices. And in this category, I'd also include recording via applications like you know, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, or, or Skype. You've then got handheld recording devices, such as a recorder you'd use for an oral history recording. These also have inbuilt microphones, which deliver a much better quality than the inbuilt mic of a phone or a computer, but still work best with external microphones connected. And I'd also add to this category using external microphones and recording into a computer audio editing program or similar. Then you've got dedicated sound equipment, a mixing board, which allows you to connect microphones, adjust and monitor the sound right there on the device. More sophisticated equipment of this, time, of this type also offers inbuilt sound effects and other audio enhancements. And finally, you have dedicated recording studios, the type you'll find used in radio, professional podcasting, and so on. So I'm going to discuss these in order in varying levels of detail. And of the first category, I'll just say that it's strongly recommended that you aim higher than using the inbuilt microphones of a phone or computer. There are many podcasts of those 2 million out there that have poor sound, but you're giving yourself very little chance of success and it doesn't take much money to get a much better sound. Even if you purchased a $50 lapel microphone to plug into your phone or an $80 USB mic for your computer, that would achieve a sound veering closer to acceptability. But I'm gonna suggest that we aim higher still, which I'm going to get to in a moment. Uh, but first, I just wanted to touch on recording via Zoom or Teams or, or similar. And again, this will in general not give you the sound quality you require to be successful in podcasting. And I wouldn't recommend it as your primary means of recording, but it does have some practical applications. And that is particularly so if you aim to record interviews that can't be done in person. So listeners by now are used to 
hearing radio and podcast conversations over telephone. So we'll generally be very forgiving of this. You just need to make sure the sound is as clear as possible. There are uh, some simple things you can do to achieve this. So use headsets like the one I'm using now. Encourage your guests to do the same. Perhaps most importantly, make sure you and your guests have a strong internet connection while recording. We've all experienced Zoom lags, audio cutouts in the last couple of years, and that's annoying enough when it's happening live in a meeting. So nobody wants to suffer through choppy audio when they're listening to a podcast. Zoom also has the capability to record audio tracks separately. So this will give you more options for enhancing the sound. And it will also allow you to record your end of the conversation using your good dedicated equipment and use the Zoom recording only for your guest. So next to handheld recording devices. And this is something of a misnomer because as I said, I'm also including recording through your computer, um, you know, on dedicated audio editing software with external microphones. And if that's your setup, then that's fine. Although recording on a hardware recorder as opposed to through a computer does reduce the potential for file corruption. So for that reason, I'd recommend it over recording straight into the computer. The main reason I've used this title here of handheld recording devices is that for many libraries, this is the equipment that you already have if your library has an oral history program. And if your library isn't recording oral histories at the moment, purchasing this equipment for podcasting will enable you to start doing oral histories as well. So if you do have such a recording device, congratulations, you're well on the way to having all the equipment you require to start your podcast. And if you don't know what I mean when I say a handheld device, on screen now, you can see a couple of examples in a Zoom and a Tascam recorder. So for clarity, it's probably important to note that this is a separate Zoom to the company I've already discussed through which you are watching this webinar. So the Zoom Corporation is a Japanese company which has been producing electronics since the 1980s. Zoom Video Communications is an American company that has entered most of our lives in a big way since COVID took off. So Zoom and Tascam are just two of many companies producing recording equipment suitable for oral histories and podcasts. So you can do your own research on what works best for your library, but I've chosen them example, as examples because they're brands you'll commonly see in oral history guides and you know, other instructional websites. So I wanna stay on that oral history thing just for a moment, because uh, as part of the library studies, portable local studies initiative from a couple of years ago, 11 libraries received some equipment for recording oral histories. So I'm just gonna show you an itemized list of some of the audio equipment that was listed in those kits. So this isn't to say these are the products you should definitely buy if you want to make a podcast. And I'm not saying you have to spend $300 on a microphone or $130 on a set of headphones. This just gives you an example of the type of equipment you'll need to get started. So if you have a recorder, microphones, microphone stands, some headphones, you've got all the technology you need. And if you don't have it, this works as a checklist for what you should be considering. So uh, by my maths, that's about $850, $900 worth of equipment there. You could get something reasonable for, you know, maybe $500. You don't have to spend that much. Alternatively, you could spend much more. And in general, the more you spend, the better you'll get, but don't consider the, the cost a barrier to entry. So microphones is something I think is worth talking about. I don't wanna get bogged down in specifics or comparing one brand to another. I just thought it would be worthwhile noting a couple of things to consider. So firstly, I want to emphasize that the best way to get sound is to use external microphones and not rely on the inbuilt mic of your recorder, which do 
give you very good sound, but there are a couple of reasons to go for external microphones. The biggest of these is that it is, in most circumstances, preferable to have each participant in your podcast on their own microphone and ideally being recorded through their own channel. So you'll have a file for your voice, you'll have a file for your co-host voice. This gives you more editing options afterwards to make any necessary adjustments to level out the sound. Just on the above point, if you are going to be recording each voice on the podcast separately, or it's just going to be one person speaking, it's recommended to use a cardioid microphone rather than an omnidirectional one. So I'll just try to briefly explain, explain the difference between those without going into too much detail. So an omnidirectional microphone will pick up everything in the room. A cardioid microphone uh, placed in, in front of a speaker will only record what is in front of it. So uh, I apologize for the, the homemade graphic. Uh, I, I hope it does the job of conveying the meaning. But so if we look at an omnidirectional microphone and imagine the circle in the middle of this chart as the microphone, an omnidirectional microphone is going to record all around you. So if you are recording in a room with multiple speakers, but you're only using one microphone, that might be the best one to go for. Uh, but it's not what I would recommend for an ideal recording environment. If you have multiple speakers with their own, each with their own microphones, a cardioid microphone will be the best way of getting a good sound. So it is only gonna pick up what is in front of it. So if I'm here, it's recording my voice, another cardioid microphone on another speaker in the room is gonna pick up that voice. Uh, so I recommend it for that reason. And the last thing I would say is to look for a pop filter. So this, this will stop those harsh p -p 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 sounds when recording. And some microphones have these inbuilt, but if not, you can purchase an external one. You can see here in this image, it's just a, a simple gauze shield. You've no doubt seen them in use in recording studios and, and so forth. They're very cheap and uh, something to consider. Um, so we've spent most of this session so far discussing recording through devices such as a Zoom recorder. And that's the way that many, many podcasts around the world are recorded and will give you a, a perfectly adequate, great sound. That doesn't mean it's the industry standard or the best possible equipment you can get. So on screen now, this is a Rodecaster Pro mixing board. It's about $900 worth of equipment and includes a range of inbuilt sound effects. It's basically custom built for podcasting. If you have one of these uh, or you, you wanna buy one, you're ready to go. Uh, you know, Something like this would, would be a, a great thing to have for your podcast. Similarly, if your library has its own recording studio and it, it's really exciting, we're living in an age where that is happening more and more, we're seeing more of them at, at different public libraries. So if you have one or your council's willing to build you one, you should definitely use that to record your podcast. A, a recording studio sits in a different space to what we've discussed already, as it's essentially just a room. You'll still need to fill it with recording equipment, but I'm operating under the assumption that if you are going to the expense of building a studio, recording studio, you will fill it with some professional grade equipment. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail about those because this is an introductory session. And if you have all this equipment, you're likely well on the way to podcasting for yourself already. But you may be, you, you may have this equipment but are still unsure about how to actually produce and publish a podcast. So we're going to move on to the next session section, which will uh, cover the recording process. So we're going to start by looking at the recording environment or where you will actually be doing the recording. And uh, I'll say it again. If you have a recording studio, that is where you should record your podcast. But if you don't, 
think about how a recording studio is set up. It's a small room, low ceilings, not a lot of place for voices to escape. So keep that principle in mind when deciding on a venue. So avoid recording in a cavern if at all possible. But I don't want to be too precious about this because plenty of successful podcasts are recorded in bedrooms, in studies, in walk-in closets, recording in a meeting room or whatever other space you have access to in your library should do the job once you've done some experimenting. So set up your recorder and microphones and start talking. See what it sounds like. Are you hearing a loud persistent hum on your recording? You may need to turn the air conditioning off. If you're getting sounds from talking colleagues outside the room and closing the doors doesn't fix it, asking them to stop talking for an hour, I think is a perfectly reasonable request. So just experiment and work on getting the best sound possible. In any activity we engage in, there is the ideal and there is what we have the means to achieve. So it is just about making the best with what you have. And once you experiment and once you get that sound, 99% of your listeners won't think about where the podcast is recorded anyway. So again, experiment, do test recordings in advance, make sure the sound is up to scratch. On the day of your actual recording, do a test recording at the start of that again, just to make sure everything is okay. When you're recording, try not to move around too much. So try not to bump the microphone, try not to rustle papers, anything like this that I'm presenting or recording, I'll typically use an iPad or a computer screen rather than papers. It's a, a, a very annoying sound that's really amplified in the recording process. One way you can do a lot to eliminate these bad noises is to wear headphones while you're recording. This will give you an insight or an approximation of what your listeners will be hearing in their ears. So if you can hear a loud, loud background noise in your ears, your listeners will likely do the same. So again, I don't wanna to be too precious about it. It's just about using what you've got to come up with the best sound you can achieve. So let's assume we've done that. You've recorded your first podcast. Now it is time to get it for ready for release. So if you're recording your mics on separate tracks, you'll need to put them all together. You may want to add some theme music or some other sounds. There might be content you would like to take out of what you've recorded. To do all this, you'll need to get the audio off your recording device and into some editing software. And there are a whole variety of programs you could use, which range in price from free to very expensive. And I'm just going to talk about one. Again, this is just an example, uh, but it is free. It is extremely popular. I'd, I'd imagine a good proportion of those 2 million podcasts are edited using this software. And it's, it's very effective. Uh, some of you may already be familiar with it from your oral history work, but that is Audacity. And one of the best things about Audacity is the amount of, amount of training and uh, you know, instructional resources are available online. That is really important in this context because I just don't have the time in this overview to go into the details and specifics of how to edit. So rather what I'm going to do is just point out a couple of things to keep in mind during the editing process. And these are some things that you can do within Audacity or a similar program with very little training. So the first of those is to mix in mono. So we're not making Sergeant Peppers here. Ideally, what you want is for the audio to sound the same in both ears if you're listening through headphones. And even if your recordings are recorded in stereo, you can very simply convert them to mono in Audacity. And it's generally advised to do that for each track at the start of the editing process. So removing background noise. One of the really great features in programs like Audacity and other audio editing software 
which you may have already used in cleaning oral history files, is to remove some of that sound in the background. It could be cassette hiss or you know a, a, another unwanted noise that is captured in the recording. So how it works is that basically you get a section of four or five seconds of audio where there is no talking. And to do that, I'd advise hitting record and leaving a gap of four or five seconds at the start. This will make an easy point for you to isolate that audio. So you isolate the audio and Audacity analyzes that tiny little section of your recording for the noises contained in it and then runs that over the duration of your file to remove it from the, from the final product. So this works best with persistent sound, like a low hum, as opposed to intermittent sounds. And going too heavy on it can have a negative effect on sound quality. So be conservative with how you use it. And more importantly, you always want to get the best recording environment possible in advance, rather than trying to fix things after the fact. And so, as I mentioned, the best way to record is to record each speaker separately. Uh, but then once you, what you'll have to do once you've recorded is to put them all together. And this can be done very simply within Audacity where you can add multiple tracks, uh, sync them up, which you know, isn't a very hard process in general and, and edit from there. So programs like that, and, and doing this will also give you the option to get the right sound out of those different vocal tracks. So ideally what you want is for all the speakers in your podcast to be recorded at about the same level and have a consistency of volume throughout the episode. And programs like Audacity feature a range of tools which will enable you to achieve this. So compression, normalization, there, there are quite a few things you can do, which uh, again, I, I don't have time to go into specifics today, but there, there is a lot of instruction out there and it is generally not too hard to do this. Uh, some other elements to consider. Removing ums and ahs. Now for anyone who has done oral history training, this will run counter to everything you've learned. So it's a little controversial in that respect, but I think there is a place for editing conversation in podcasting, especially when removing vocal tics like ums and ahs. You want to be careful with this. You want to tread warily because you don't want to do it to the point where you're losing the flow of the conversation. But just remember that in podcasts, you're up against professional broadcasters, speakers, with years of experience. So cleaning up the conversation a bit while you're working on your vocal technique may improve the overall listening experience. And again, adding theme music, adding in oral history clips or whatever other sound effects that you feel may assist your podcast can be very easily done with a program like Audacity. So it, it's probably worth briefly mentioning copyright at this point. We're all library staff, so I, I don't want to go on about it too much. Oops, gone ahead there. I don't want to go on about it too much, uh, but it's something to consider that music's generally copyrighted. So you want to take advantage of royalty free websites online and, and other things like that when you're considering what audio elements to insert into your podcast. So preservation, and again, I'm dealing with library staff here, but I don't know how many podcasts actually do keep preservation copies of their shows, but you all have the industry experience and the, the technical requirements to do so. So please record with web files. For one thing, all the cool audio tricks that I mentioned, noise removal and that sort of thing, they work much better with an uncompressed format such as WAV than they do with MP3. If you're recording an MP3, your options for, for fixing your audio are far more limited. So record and edit in WAV and keep a preservation copy in WAV as well. So MP3s should only be used for publishing and for access copies. So, um, you know, that's pretty straightforward, but, but something to keep in mind. 
Okay, so you've got your recording equipment. You've recorded a great episode with perfect sound. You've edited it. You've saved it as a WAV. You've produced an MP3 copy for distribution. Now what? Well, now you need to make it available to people. So if you're a podcast listener with an Android phone, there's you may listen to them through Google Podcasts. If you use an iPhone, there's a good chance you'll listen to them through Apple Podcasts. Or if you are an iPhone user who's discovered that Apple Podcasts sucks and seems to be getting worse with each successive update, you may have moved onto a prop platform like Spotify. Regardless, it's important to make it easy for your listeners and to have your podcast available sitting side by side with the other shows in their rotation. Don't make them do any extra work of having to go to a different location to find your podcast than they would do uh, for other podcasts. So think of these as the big three that whatever else you need to make sure your podcast is available on these platforms. Now that's not to say you can't make them available in other places, whether that is making it available somewhere like SoundCloud, on YouTube, on your library website or your library catalogue. I think making your podcast available in as many places as possible is always a good thing. And if you've had four downloads of an episode on your library website in 12 months, well, that's still four listeners that you probably wouldn't have had otherwise. So the big point is that getting them on those big three and on Apple in particular is essential. So I say Apple in particular, as in addition to those bigger platforms, there are a whole host of podcast listening apps that people may use. And many of those pull their podcasts straight from the Apple feed. So by being available on Apple Podcasts, you may see your podcast pop up on apps that you hadn't even heard of without you having to do anything to get it there. So how do you do that? How do you get your podcast available on Apple or Spotify or Google? What you don't do is to get your MP3 file and upload it directly to Apple or Google. That's not how it works. So those popular listening apps, they don't actually host podcast files. That's something you need to do separately. What happens instead is that Apple Podcasts pulls the podcast from where the MP3 file is hosted. So that will allow listeners to download it onto their devices and listen through the podcast listening app of their choice. And this is done through the magic of an RSS feed. And if you don't know what that is, that's all right. You don't need to know what it is. You just need to know that you need one. But basically, and, and I don't really know what it is either. So uh, I, I hope any experts uh, will correct this if it's wrong. But basically, it's a piece of HTML code that will tell Apple where to find you, where those MP3 files are that your listeners can then access. So there are a couple of ways to do this, to, to get an RSS feed, depending on where you choose to host your files. So that may be through your library website. You may have a web page where you upload all your files. Each episode has a file and you get your RSS feed through your library website. It may be through a third party hosting platform. And of those, there are many. So Buzzsprout, Podbean, Anchor, Wooshka. There are just a few examples where it's a you know third party platform. You have a, a space there where you upload your files. Most of them offer some free services, but um, it, that'll have limited capability. You might only be able to upload a couple of episodes at a time and, and have limited support or, or stats. But if, if you pay for it, you can host all your podcasts there. And, um, and there are pros and cons of each, whether it's hosting the 
MP3 files on your library website or using one of these platforms. But overall, I'd recommend going with one of these third party platforms just to make the experience for yourself as easy as possible. Remember these websites are, are custom built for getting podcasts available to people. So they will save you the hassle of having to connect to multiple podcast apps. It will generate the RSS feeds that you need. It will give you instruct instruction on what you need to do with that RSS feed to get it onto Apple. Depending on the platform, they'll provide varying levels of technical support. And it will also give you access to download statistics and other useful analytics. But what you may choose to do is use a platform like Buzzsprout, but also host the podcast on your own library website, giving your show its own dedicated page and a place for your library users to download directly. And so it'll give your listeners an added method of access, as well as giving you a place to add links, notes, any other related material for episodes of your podcast. So. This is basically the entire process from conception to publication. Obviously, there is a lot more detail involved in these steps. I've tried to keep it simple and provide just a basic overview, um, but I know it may seem overwhelming if you're completely new to podcasting. I see we have some questions in the chat, so I'm just gonna finish up by attempting to answer them. Um, I'll give a disclaimer that I am very much not an audio expert, but I will uh, do my best. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go down to the start. Okay, so a lot of these questions are for public libraries. So I might put them, compile them and, and put them in the PLN and hopefully get some feedback that way. So um, there, there are questions about the process, about what download statistics public libraries are seeing. These are, um, these are really questions for public libraries to answer. Uh, similarly, there are a, a lot of like really good technical information coming through. I can see some good stuff from uh, Chris Fulham here. So I'll also, I'll, I'll compile that. I'll, I'll put all this information together. Um, yeah, so a lot of great stuff here. And I think, oh, Kayama's first episode is up. So Good Librations is the name of that, if I'm remembering correctly. So uh, congratulations to, to Carla and the team at Kayama. Um, I will uh, look forward to hearing that. And the final question is, will the webinar be recorded? And yes, it is being recorded. So I will make that available uh, to all attendees. So please feel free to share with your colleagues uh, or, or anyone else who's missed out. Um, is there one more question, I think? Oh, and, and another, uh, Tamworth City is has produced a podcast and Umina Beach has a podcast. So there, there are a few um, other podcasts coming through. So again, what I'll do is compile all of, of this information and, um, and yeah, I'll, I'll put them all together and send them out uh, either via the PLN or by um, sending out an email. So um, that marks the end of the session. So uh, thank you all for attending and please feel free to get in touch if there are any other specific questions. But um, good luck with your podcasting. As I said, I'm really excited to see what you all get up to. So um, thanks again.